Hi, everybody. Happy Monday to you. God bless you. So good to see you today. Hope you had a fantastic day. I know it's warm outside, isn't it? Listen, up here, even in Indiana. I don't listen. I've been outside. You can tell my hair's just flying all the way. <laughs> um, Indiana, listen, East Texas girl, I thought this was hilarious. So all my Texas friends, you're going to think this is so funny. My phone went off um saying that we had a warning for heat advisory in indiana i was like wow a heat advisory in indiana and it was a heat advisory okay all my texas folks y'all ready for 84 degrees <laughs> i just laughed out loud i mean i mean come on y'all y'all think that's funny i was like Oh, they don't even have a clue. But I will say it has gotten warmer today in Indiana and it's gotten up like around 90 or 91. So these pray for these people up here in Indiana because they just don't know how to handle this 90 degree weather. And um, so warnings has been going going off about heat advisories. And I guess when you're acclimated to color like if you was to come to indiana in the winter um there's times that i'll just walk outside because i'm just about to burn up but i have some of my texas friends come up and they're about to freeze to death so it's just whatever you get used to huh <laughs> and i went outside and girls look my hair is just flying every which way it is what it is i have a lot to say, of course, and so we're going to get started, but before we get started, tonight I'm going to be sharing a open vision that I had, um, and some of the things that I have been kind of studying and put together, and I want to share something um, that the, I might share something that the Lord spoke to me today. I don't know. I, I have a feeling it's a word for when we get to surge conference. So I may be holding on to that, but guess what? It's almost time for all of you guys in East Texas and those that are going to make plans to join. Hope Church there in Murchison, Texas is getting ready to have their conference called Surge. Listen, you don't want to miss it. It is going to be fantastic. Pastors Chris and Lisa Wilson and that whole entire uh, church family down there, they are preparing and I know what I'm talking about. We have had some powerful moments and some fun moments and some exciting moments and some God wink so many times in those meetings that I, you, you won't, you won't regret the time that you have to take, or maybe even the financial sacrifice that you have to make in order to attend surge. But listen, it's going to kick off on June the 22nd. And it's going to go through the 26th. Pastor Greg DeVries from Alabama. Hear my heart. Pastor Greg, I met him at Sonia Isaacs' house in her living room. And we were having a prayer meeting with the Isaacs there. And Pastor Greg was there. And the first time I ever got to meet Pastor Greg, Lily, Mama Isaac, Lily Isaacs was said, come pray for Pastor Greg, and I didn't even get to be introduced to him. The first thing I ever did was pray for him, and when the when I began to pray for him, the Holy Ghost just hit that man. He bolted, <laughs> bolted, and hit the floor, and uh, when he got up, uh, we, um, he began to talk to Pastor Aaron and Amanda and say, you know, you know, who is this person? Let's connect, and so I got to see him again at Restoring Hope, church at overflow at their yearly summer conference which is also coming up in july you'll have to go to restoring hope church's uh website to get those dates but i got to see him again he has a prophetic voice he's also a great bible teacher he has a discipleship in a huge church um in alabama he has a beautiful wife. She is a precious spirit and he has a ton of kids. <laughs> just a, a, he is a very large family and he is just amazing. And I haven't got to, I haven't known him very long, but what I have met of him, he seems to be a very humble and kind man. And I know he is going to be a blessing 
to those there at Surge. And then right after him, he's going to be there. He's going to do the first two nights, the 22nd and the 23rd. And then Pastor Tony Suarez is going to be there for one night only, right there in the middle. And then yours truly, I'm going to end this thing. <laughs> I'm going to end it, put a bow on it, tie it up. And uh, I will be there at the end. And uh, it's it's going to be a really amazing time. I love going to Hope because that's my family down there. I'm from down there. And so I get to see not only my church family down there, but my real family. My, that's where my son goes to church. And so I get to see him. And it's just, it's just amazing. It's just a very special place to go. So if you need more information, you can go to um, their Facebook page and um, look up all that. Plus, I've been trying to do my best. Y'all know I'm so great at Facebook. You know I love it, right? Y'all know I love Facebook, right? Anyway, uh, I've been trying to share. <laughs> Casey has had to box me and say, uh, excuse me, Miss Rana, listen, do your job share this, share this conference. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, okay. Um, also a really cool thing that the pastors are doing down there. You get to, you have to register. It's registration is free, but they need to kind of have a head count. Okay. So we want to register, but also you get to nominate your pastor so they're going to choose one pastor for a free getaway to come down there and get poured into and i think his um his uh his hotel will be taken care of and plus the church is going to give him bless him with five hundred dollars cash just to spend on you know whatever he wants to do you know, buy water burger gift cards for me when I get down there. I mean, it, it all works out in the end. And so um, you get to nominate your pastor because let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Pastors need to be their cup filled. They need to be poured into. And they go to these conferences just to do that. A lot of pastors. I don't think I have, I don't think I have done a conference or a Bible in years that pastors didn't come because they just wanted to get their cup filled just a little bit. And so let me tell you, it's going to be a powerful time. So get over there on Facebook, go over to their website and um, get registered to be there. Make plans to be there. Nominate your pastor, your man of God, your woman of God, and, 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 and tell why they should be nominated, why they shouldn't be down there. And uh, you know, $500, come on. That is a lot of Whataburger, okay? It's going to be a great, great week. Um, I'm so good to see everybody. Hey, Donna and Casey and Pastor Steve and uh, Candace and let me see if I can see everybody. Colton and Janice and Casey and, oh, Pastor Chris and Lisa are on, on here. My mother, Andrea Goldinger. Boy, everybody is on here. Angela, if I didn't say your name, I'm sorry, Kristen. Everybody's on here. Praise God. We got new faces on here. Um, I want to get right into it, okay? So I don't keep you very long. Um, but I want to share with you what I do on these Monday nights. It's kind of casual. And sometimes we get on here and I share my heart, something that I've been studying in scripture. Sometimes I just share what's going on. Um, we are, my husband and I are in the process of purchasing property to, to pastor a church. Listen, we heard from them today. My husband has been at the church today on the property today, and it's it was inspected today. And guess what? The inspection came back amazing. Praise God. So the inspection of the of the buildings have all come back amazing. As a matter of fact, he um, asked my husband, he said, how much are, are, are you buying this property for? And he said, that that's insane. He said, this property is worth three times, four times that amount. But hear my heart. Can I tell you, I was trying to figure out when we first saw the property, Jason and I are getting ready to start a church slash discipleship. Okay. So we're in the process. We have found a building. We made an offer. They accepted the offer, but we, when we first found it, we thought, is this, it must be a misprint. And so we contacted our, our realtor 
that we have bought houses from and, and done business with before. And he kept saying, this is, this is a misprint. You know, I'll get to the bottom of it. We'll come to find out it was not a misprint that the person was, they were really selling these buildings. So we thought, what's wrong with the buildings? Well, now we've had them inspected and they're pretty solid. They're, matter of fact, the one building, he said, that thing is, you can't get any better. And so it's been, it's just a really solid, solid thing. And God is doing a good thing. But we found out why we're getting the buildings at the cost that we're getting them from. And that's because the pastor that has been pastor in this church has gotten very, very ill and is having major surgery. And so he is, um, um, what's when they say that he's cleaning up his affairs, he's getting his, he's getting his house in order to go home. Well, y'all know me. <laughs> when I heard that, I thought, oh, we got to find this man, pray for a divine healing and let him have his church back. <laughs> You know, because here I am, I'm, you know, I'm excited because I'm getting this property at such an amazing value. And so I'm, I am, we are, we are speaking life and praying over this, that I've never even met him in person, but we're praying, praying over him and his family. And, you know, I don't know what the sickness is, or I don't know his story. I don't know the story. I just know that he is uh, getting his affairs in order. And so that's why he has this church and he's just like, this is what we're going to do. You take it and you now you grow in it. So let's I I have his name written down, but let you don't need to know his name. God knows his name. And so we're going to just send the word to that pastor um, that has this church and we're going to bless him and call his call him out before the throne of God. And and I believe that God can do a divine healing, manifestation healing in him and um, do an amazing thing in his people. I don't know all the story. I just know that that's what I found out. And the first thing I thought about was, oh, well, in other words, we just kind of put buying the building on hold for a second and began to speak the word of God over this man's life, right? And so that's what we were doing. So Praise God, but we heard from our bank today and they said, you know, we're still working on some numbers, but everything looks good. So they haven't said yes yet, but they're not said no either. So, you know, they're just, um, Harrison Ministries is a nonprofit and we're having to cross every T and dot every I. And we want to do this the right way. And we're good stewards. We have been st good stewards from the beginning and we're gonna continue to do so. Because when we take care of things in the right manner, with the right heart, then God, he will bless the work of our hands for sure. Um, I want to start off by going, how many seen my Facebook post of the lion? And I said this next Monday night, I'm going to be sharing a bit about a vision. Jason and I, um, when we when we bought this house out here, yeah, I won't go into that whole store. When we bought this house, this house is a great house, but and the property was a little bit not cleaned up, and it was and it was not the man's fault. The man is super super nice that lived in this house. His family built this house, um, but he was going blind, and so he wasn't. He was just unable to take care of some of the things outside, and so we have spent a lot of time cleaning up and making the going to the dump and everything like that. And so we've had to rip all the, the old yucky weed infested um, landscaping and just kind of start again. Okay. And so we wasn't going to put too much into it this year. We just got too many. We have, I have so many irons in the fire right now, guys, <laughs> just continue to pray for me. Cause I I'm, I'm being pulled in so many different areas and we have a lot of decisions to make and we want to make, we're not afraid of them. We just want to make the right ones. And so, um, working on my home and working is, is kind of like a, a a stress reliever to me. So I'm outside. I'm not thinking about anything. I am just literally on my, my knees and I'm digging in this dirt. I'm actually, I have a little baby hosta 
and I am digging a hole, getting ready to plant this hosta. I'm not thinking about buying the church. I'm not thinking about um, the things I've got to get done. I'm literally right there in the moment, okay? And just, just like that, I don't know if you believe in open visions, but when you work in the office of prophet, there are times that the Lord can speak to me. There's times I'll, I'll discern something. I'll just have a knowing. And there's times I have dreams. And then there's times that I'll be doing something and then bam, I'll just be, I'll see something else. Um, we've, uh, y'all probably heard me tell this story, but I've always wondered what it was like for someone else to be with me when I go into an open vision. <laughs> well, Charlene has had that privilege. And uh, real quick, she picked me up in San Antonio, Texas to start a conference there. And normally I don't eat. Bef I don't eat before church. I, that's just something I never do. I may not eat that day. You know, I just don't. I'm, I'm already in the zone and just sitting down to eat. It's just too much of my energy or something. I don't know. And so I, um, um, for this particular day, she was like, let's just run over here. And I think it was like an Applebee's and get some tea and maybe just small salad just to have something. I think I had been traveling most of that day. Uh, since early that morning. So we had decided to do that, which was rare. Soon as I sat down, my little salad came. And when I went to take a bite of my salad, when my, when my fork went to go into my mouth, I went into an open vision and I saw the platform of the church we were going. I saw the people on the platform where we were going and the Lord began to speak to me a word for, for a gentleman that was going to be on that platform. Well, I'm seeing it, but I must, I continue to feed myself, but I'm missing my mouth. So all Char is seeing is me taking a fork to my mouth and salad hitting my lap. And she says, Ron, what are you doing? And I, I saw the salad in my, in my lap. Is it that way every time? I don't know. But it was kind of like that this day. And this happened just a few days ago. And so I'm in my yard and I am digging this hole to plant this little baby hosta. When all of a sudden I'm in an open vision. It was so real that it startled me as if it really happened. Like I, I couldn't tell. I didn't when it was hap it happened so fast, but I couldn't tell because it was so real that I was envisioned for, I have to say for a split second, it was happening. <laughs> okay. So I saw myself planting this hosta, but I heard behind me a male lion and he charged me. And I turned and I saw this male lion it's, I, I dropped my little spatula thing that I was digging with. I dropped it. I dropped my hosta and I, it startled me. And I kind of backed up to my house because I thought there's a lion. And so I saw this male lion and when he, he ran and dug his paws, like slid into the ground and opened his mouth and just ah, and growled at me. And it, 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 I mean, for, you know how you can think something in a split second? So in a split second, I thought the, a lion just came out of the woods. And I'm thinking, you're in Indiana, <laughs> you know, like it was that, it was that real. And it was, it was for a split second, very terrifying. Um, but soon as I was terrified, it was like the Holy Spirit went, <laughs> And I knew I was in a vision and I knew what I was looking at immediately. And of course, soon as I saw it, soon as I felt it, it was over. And then I, I kind of blinked my eyes and I was standing up in my yard. And of course, there was no lion there, but it was so real. It was so, I heard the growl. I saw his feet slide into the dirt he had one paw in front of another and he, he charged at me. He wasn't going to attack me. He was, he was making me think he was 
getting ready to. And so I literally, I stood up and I, I knew I, it was a vision. I knew it wasn't the line of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> That's what I did know. It was not Judah. I knew that it was Satan. But I had to sit back. Don't ever think that when the Lord shows you something that it's for everybody else. I never think, oh, that's a word for the church. Sometimes, can, can I just talk to you? Sometimes I know that it is. Prophetically, I just, I can't explain that. I just know that it is a, a word for the church. But if I don't have a specific prophetic knowing, this is a word for, like the word I got tonight when I was, today when I was spending time with the Lord and doing some study, getting ready for surge, I heard the Lord speak a word. I'll probably preach it in Murchison. And I knew when he spoke it, it wasn't just for me. It was for me, but it, he was speaking a prophetic word for those that have ears to hear. And, and, and I know it's going to take, um, I don't know what Pastor Greg DeVries is preaching, of course, and I don't know what Pastor um, um, Suarez is preaching, but I know what the Lord is speaking to me. And I know it's going to flow and I know it's going to be powerful. And he's, he's, he's speaking to me a word that's going to probably finalize or even um, um, give a, a um, confirmation on what the other two ministers are ministering about. And so um, that's just how that kind of works for me. So I never think unless I have a knowing that I'm exempt from it. So immediately my thought was, why has the Lord allowed me, opened my eyes to see this Satan charging me? What, what gave him the authority to do it? Now, I'm just being raw with y'all because I people think because of my prophetic gifts, I just float on water or I just float across air. or I spend 24 hours, seven days a week in a prayer closet. No, I live life. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I clean house like you cannot believe. Like I live life. I'm, I'm, I'm just like you guys. I dig in the dirt. You know what I'm saying? And so I have to, I have flesh. I have. Um, my own person to to put under the blood to crucify I, I, I'm also growing I'm also um, processing some things and so my first question it was so real you can't tell me I didn't see it I saw that lion as as clear as I'm seeing you right now and I knew it was Satan and I knew he was charging me and I thought why God is not causing him to charge me what in me has made him think that he has the right to show up come on the toughest thing that you're going to do in your life is ask the Holy Spirit to examine you Matter of fact, don't do that if you don't have the guts to follow through. Do you hear what I'm saying? You just keep on being your simple little Christian. You just keep going to your little church on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights and your little Bible studies and singing your little songs and doing your little dance. You just keep doing that. Because if you want to really have an intimacy, to really know who Jesus is. That takes guts. Not everybody, multitudes of people went to hear Jesus, but very, very few, 12, had the guts to follow him. Okay? I'm talking about 
to follow Christ is to leave everything that you thought you knew was truth behind. Because you can't follow Christ and follow denomination at the same time. It's impossible. You can't follow Christ and follow regurgitated words from people you hold in high esteem at the same time. It doesn't work that way. You cannot follow man and follow Christ at the same time. It doesn't work that way. Not to say that we don't receive from man. I hope that you're receiving something from me right now, but you should never position yourself and put me in, the, in a place in your heart that I don't deserve. I didn't shed blood for you. I've never taken a strap on my back for you. I can't save you, redeem you. I, I didn't pay a price for your life. Christ did. My job is to point you to him, not to me. And if there's a minister or a prophet or a pastor or an apostle or a teacher that's ever preaching from a prideful place, a, a heart of arrogance, even a little bit, that is pointing you to how great they are and how a powerful they are, then they're showing you what they believe. They're showing you their fruit, their heart. And so going back to this line, when I saw it, I didn't think all about all of y'all. I thought, what has happened that the Lord has allowed? And now I was thankful. I was appreciative that he opened my spiritual eyes to see that Satan had somehow got the okay to charge me. So I didn't cry about it. I didn't worry about it. I just began to seek the Lord because guess what? You know what I'm going to say. When you seek the Lord, then you find him. So that night I went to bed, went on to sleep. And normally I don't sleep. I'm not a sound sleeper. Like you can't sneak up on me. I mean, I, I have to be like in a, like, extremely tired I, I have I have a mama's ears like I can hear my kids I can hear you know I can I'm not a sound sleeper and this particular night though I went into one of those coma sleeps like no dreaming deep sleep I'm sleeping sound you know what I'm talking about but I woke up about three times that night, not because I heard something, but because my prophetic could feel that lion walking around my bedroom. And I would sit up in bed and I would look around expecting to be in a vision. I felt him pacing in that bedroom so much that I expected to see him in a vision again. But whether I saw him or not, prophetically, he was pacing in my bedroom and I would set up in bed and I'd say, I don't know what you think you're doing, but you don't belong here. If you are here and God is allowing, then he is going to use this for my good, not yours. And I lay down, go back to sleep. About the second, I don't know how many an hour or two would pass and I would feel that line walking, pacing around in my bedroom. I, he wasn't growling. He was just walking, just walking around. And I would feel this lion and I would set up and I'd say, you do not have any place here. You don't have authority here. And then I would go and I would lay back down. This happened about three times that night. So as you can imagine, I began to seek the Lord. And the first thing I began to do, of course, everybody knows the scripture that we're, that we're going to talk about when the Bible says that the, that Satan goes around like a roaring lion. OK, but I don't want to go straight to that scripture. I know that that's probably where we're going to end up. But I want to point out some things about this lion that I saw, because let me tell you something. Here's where 
the reason why I wanted to share it here is because if, if it's happening with me, nine times out of 10, it's happening with something similar is happening with you. And maybe we can get to the victory at the same time. You know what I'm saying? But there's one thing about male lines, and I began to write some things down with them. There's male lines, and y'all know the male line and what it looks like. It's big, it's beautiful, has the big mane. But then the female lines, they're called the lioness, okay? The male lines, I began to do some research on what would make a male line charge, because Clearly, I knew when I was in that open vision, he was not going to attack me. He wasn't going to be able to bite me or kill me, but he was able to charge me. I knew that was the word. He made a charge towards me. I wanted to know exactly what he was trying to do. Male lines will charge, are y'all ready? When they feel threatened. <laughs> victory <laughs> see so what I what that's the first thing that is the first thing that happens listen male lines let me see your faces isn't this amazing <laughs> Male lines charge when they feel threatened. I read that right there, Miss Donna, and I just had to put everything. I didn't go any further, not at that moment. And I thought, ooh, <laughs> praise God. And it reminded me of a vision that I had. I had the opportunity several years ago. There is a there's a prison in East Texas called Gurney Prison, out past Palestine, Texas. And I had the opportunity. I was invited to go into this prison and to minister to these inmates. Well, my mother, she's on here. She looked at me with full, full passion, with all the passion that she had and was not supportive at all. And she's probably laughing. But my mother looked at me, a grown woman, I'm a grown woman too. And she says to me, over my dead body, are you going into that prison? That's what she said to me, <laughs> which I thought, well, mother, why are you telling me where I'm gonna go minister? She said, no, 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 no. You're not going in that prison. Mm -mm. They're not going to hear a word you got to say. <laughs> That's what she was saying. No daughter of mine. And she was getting hot mad. My mother's going to be laughing at me. She was getting hot mad at the person that had invited me to come. Because th this shouldn't have been a thought in her mind. Like, no, my daughter's not going into your prison to preach. Well, I didn't just say no I personally didn't want to go into that prison either I mean I didn't feel called to that people who go, who feel called to prison ministries they do great at that praise the Lord and more power to you but the Lord at that point the Lord had not showed me about going into a prison and I'm I don't want to be where I'm not supposed to be. I don't want to make something happen okay uh, just because it's a good thing doesn't mean it's a God thing, okay? And so I begin to seek the Lord. Listen, hear my heart. That's where you're missing it. You don't have to make these major decisions by yourself. The problem is a decision will come and you will look at it and your good thing will turn to your, in your mind, oh, this gotta be God. And then you talk yourself into it and He's not even in it. It's a good thing, but it may not be a God thing. Or it could be a good thing that looks like a God thing that you really want to be your thing and you really have no business doing it. Well, I didn't want to be in this prison. Um, that takes some doing to do that. And you have to go through a lot of hoops to do that. 
um, things can go wrong, believe it or not. And I thought, and I, you know, I don't want to do this if, if God, if you didn't want me to do, but I'm the type of person that the Lord says, I want you to go to 10 buck two. And I want you to scream to the top of your lungs, Jesus, from the top of this mountain. Guess what? This girl's going to start hiking a mountain. I want to be where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there. And so I began to seek the Lord and I began to say to him, Father, I don't want to go to this prison because they're inviting me just because it's a door. I've had churches hear my heart. I've had churches to call me and say, Sister Ronna, can you come hold me a revival? And I said, no, <laughs> no, I can't because I, I didn't. I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. It wasn't time for me to be there. I wasn't I wasn't their evangelist. Um, I, I've said no. When I, when it looked like on my schedule, like I needed to say yes, but I, I'm really passionate about those kind of things. So I begin to seek the Lord and I begin to say, Lord, if I'm to go into that prison, then you show me that I'm supposed to go. Because if you tell me, I will have to, my mother will have to just get over it. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's just the way it was. And so no disrespect to her, but I had to do what God was calling me to do. Well, that night I went into a prophetic dream. I had never been in this prison before ever or any prison to, I'll just say that at this point, never been in any prison. And yet in this dream, I walked through this gate. Then I walked through this office, through this little room with these doors slamming behind me into this courtroom, I mean, into this courtyard, and I didn't see buildings. I saw it looked like bunk houses that went all the way down this way and a gate that went around this way. Listen, guys, when I got to Gurney, it was exactly, I had already walked through every one of those gates before in a dream, but here's what took me to that prison is when I walked through that last gate and I'm standing there in this dream, this was not open vision. This was a dream. I began to see little children running out of these bunk houses from far away. They look like little toddlers. Look, little bitty children, three and four and five years old. But as they got closer to me, I saw the distorted faces and I knew that they wasn't children at all. They were demons. And I wasn't afraid. And let's just be real. They wasn't afraid. It was like we had a, a, a meeting that had to take place. And matter of fact, they all came and started just sitting on the ground all around me. I was like hundreds of them these demons, these little children. And I just stood there and waited for them to all get out of the bunkhouses and gather. I just sat there and waited. It was like, this was a meeting that I had with them. And finally they all got settled and sat down and, and I'm just looking at them like this. And finally the, the one in the front in this dream, he opened his mouth. And when he, when he spoke, his voice sounded like, his voice sounded like an iron door squeaking. I, I'll never forget it. It sounded like a real, have you ever heard an iron door? It squeaked like that. And this is what he said in this dream. He says to me, please, please don't come in here. Well, that was just my sign. I was supposed to go. <laughs> I mean, when he said that, he begged me. He begged me. He said that before I could respond, he goes, please, please don't come in here. And in my spirit, I thought, oh, you don't want me coming. That means, wow, that means, oh, I'm something major is getting ready to take place in this prison that maybe have never took, taken place before. My mama, bless her heart, we'll just have to pray for her because God is, and I said, I said to the, 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 the demon that's talking to me, I said to him, and I said, how long have you been here? And he sat back like this and he said, oh, he sounded like an old door. I talking an old squeaky door. He said, oh, we've been here for years. 
months and years. Please don't come in here. And all of a sudden I felt the presence of the Lord come on me. And I pointed my finger and I said, I'm coming. And when I get there, every demonic spirit in this place will have to go in Jesus name. I am coming to this prison. And I woke up and I called my mother and I said, listen. And so my mother says, well, if you're going, I'm going. So she went from me I, over her dead body. You're not going to her going with me. And she did. She went, we had a group of people that went and we had, we had an amazing time and God did some amazing things. And that's not where I'm going in this story, but where I'm going is when I saw the mail line charge and then I researched and I found out that the only reason why I mail line charges is because he has been threatened. See, the lioness, the female lion, she's going gonna, gonna to eat you and kill you. But a male lion, he's going to sit in a shade. He's just going to sit, you know, wait for his girls. Let's just be real. But if a male lion gets up and charges you, that's because he is threatened. You have threatened his kingdom. You have threatened something that is precious to him. He is not going to get up from his lazy self out of his shade, away from his lioness, away from his, the, his girls that do his bidding and move away from all of that and charge something unless he's been threatened. That's how I felt. I felt just like, when I heard that demon that said, please don't come in here. When he charged at me and when I put all this together, I, it was like, you are threatening something. You, I'm not going to let you, you are threatening what I'm trying to do. And even though it was startling at the moment, and even though it was so real, I realized that I needed to continue to say, and this is how it started. Can I just tell you the truth? I didn't start seeking the Lord by a certain thing so I could go preach somewhere. You preachers that are studying to go preach so that you can sound good, look good, have something good to say behind your pulpit, that's backwards. You're putting the horse before the cart. We preach and study because we want to show ourselves approved. We want, we want, we want to be crucified in Christ. We want to stand in his presence and be a reflection of who he is so that when we are, we do have the opportunity and the privilege to open our mouth and prophesy and speak to his people, not yours. Then we are held accountable for the things that we say and that we are sending and pointing the, the children of God, the people of God back to him and not to ourselves. So I'm constantly saying, Lord, show me myself. And I've been passionate, really passionate about this. And there's some other things I can share, but that's, this is not the time and the place right now. But I have done something in a heavenly place that has threatened not demons. I have threatened Satan. What are you doing in your life? What are you doing with your personal relationship to, that you're building with Jesus Christ that makes Satan leave his pride and leave his comfortable zone and charge you? If he ain't charging you, you're going in the same direction he is. And now we got a whole other problem. We need to be threatening to Satan. And so that's why he charged. He feels threatened. He feels threatened by our sacrifice. He is threatened by your mindset. He is threatened by the things that you have stood to believe. 
things you may not see it happening. You may not feel it happening. It may look like nothing is going your way. It may not look like your church is growing. It may not look like the finances are getting any better. It may not, this sickness may be hanging on a few days longer, but you are still going to have to operate as a threat to the kingdom. And how you do that is no matter how you feel, no matter what you see, no matter what you think about, whatever you, whatever carnal fleshly thing that you become passionate about, when you begin to put that under the blood and when you begin to speak the word of God and get out of your own way then you become a threat to the kingdom of satan god is looking for people that are going to threaten him char he calls satan to charge you another thing they will charge if they charge you know what experts say that if you're ever charged by a male line you know what they tell you to do Stand still. <laughs> what does the Bible say? Stand still and know that I am God. In, the, in, in, in nature, if you are charged by a male line and you run, you are dead. Male lines run about 35 miles per hour. A lioness will run around 45. OK, if you are charged by a male line in nature and you run or if you show fear. You're dead. You're dead. But if you stand still. As he's threatening you, charging at you. That's how you survive. How do you we stand still? We know who in which we serve. We know in whom we believe. The Bible says, stand still and know. Stand still and dwell. Stand still and be crucified. Be a living sacrifice. Stand still and know who your Jehovah Jireh is. Stand still and know who your Jehovah Rapha is. Stand still and know who it is that you say that you love. That's the first thing. If you don't, you're dead. You won't make it. The enemy has you. Another thing that I read is that male lines, how many of you knows that when COVID started coming out, people kept saying, what is the Lord telling you about COVID? What is the Lord telling you about COVID? And when I began to seek the Lord about COVID-19, the Lord, remember what the Lord said? He said, the Lord said, COVID-19 is a decoy. There's something way worse. <laughs> remember that? Male lines, they're unable to camouflage themselves. They have no ability once they're there, they're there. They, they, they can't really camera. They don't have no special, nor do they even think about it. Um, if they ever present themselves to you in a charge, what they're doing is they are being a decoy of what the real danger is. <laughs> in other words, the enemy wants you to focus on his threat, but he's not what you got to worry about. It's the lioness. It's his pride. It's his, it's his demons. It's the things that are coming over here that he's going to get you looking here. He's going to get you focused right here when really this is a decoy and this is the danger. It's kind of what, what's going on in America today. Your media, people in, in places in government, I can't say all of them, I don't know, but there are people that are trying to get you to look at things right here. They're trying to get you to put your attention and draw your attention over here. And it is bad. 
but it's a decoy because they're actually doing something way worse over here. You see what I'm saying? And so male lions, because they can't camouflage, what they'll do is they'll come out and charge and make themselves known, get your attention. They'll get you focused on their threat. They'll try to get you to get focused and get, get, get you know, bellow up with fear from them. That way, the demons over here that are on assignment, all they got to do, you're over here feeling sorry for yourself. You're over here wondering how you're going to pay your bills. You're wondering, you're over here um, uh, uh, feeling pain in your body, wanting to know what's wrong, Googling symptoms, uh, diagnosing yourself. You know, come on, we being, being human, so to speak, just doing all these things. And really what's happening is there's getting ready to be, you're getting ready to be blindsided. Another thing that I studied about male lions is what is their male, what is their main job? They protect pride. The Bible says that pride cometh before the fall. Pride is arrogance. Now, I know in the natural, when you say a male lion in, in the pride of lions, it's a group of lioness. But it, it literally says male lions protect the pride. This demon, this Satan coming as a roaring lion, he protects pride. You know what will keep you out of the kingdom of God? Pride. Arrogance. You want to know what will keep you from being a living sacrifice and getting transformed by the renewal of your mind? Pride. The, when you look at Romans 12 and it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present yourselves a living sacrifice, pure, holy, acceptable, the perfect will of God, y'all know, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove the good, the, you know, the scripture. But when you go past that, there'll be step by step of how to become that living sacrifice. And one of the steps one of the beginning steps of becoming a living sacrifice, it says this, not to think more highly of yourself than you should. Let me tell you something. The satanic church, if you, if you was to do, I've, I've had to deal, and I'm not going to go into it. Y'all know I've had to deal with satanic churches in my ministry. I've had to deal with witches i've had to deal with cult leaders they've come they they love to come to my meetings okay and i myself has have been i have been at one time in a situation where i was a, in a parking lot with several church buses and they were all none of it wasn't the, the baptist church of so-and-so and the pentecostal church of so-and-so this every one of these churches was I remember one was the Satanic Church of Evansville, Indiana. I mean, it was the Satanic Church of this. It was probably 30 Satanic Church buses out there in this parking lot where I was at. And I remember thinking when they got out, they didn't have black fingernails and black hair and heavy makeup. They looked like nurses and doctors and school teachers and people at Walmart. They, they look like, they look like me. They didn't look like, they didn't get out of those buses with horn. They had on loafers and polo shirts and t-shirts and cargo shorts. And they look like me. And so I, I began to, I've talked to some of them and you know, the real people who really belong to what they call the satanic church, they don't actually this is what they say. Now we know that they are, but they say we don't actually worship Satan. But see, it's a lie even in their head because satanic worship or the church of Satan, the Bible of Satan teaches them to think of themselves high and mighty. 
you are a God. Okay. Now, in our Christian Bible, the crucifying of our flesh, the trading of our filthy rags for his righteousness is so that we could be in the image and the likeness of Christ. In their church, you are you are a God. It's to what you do. And so the enemy has lied to them and then worship, they worship their, their own power. They worship themselves. And there may be little idols along the way, sexual perversions, um, sacrifice, um, um, tarot cards, fortune telling, it goes into all these different avenues of things, crystals, um, all different prayers, chanting. It goes into all these different avenues. But if you want to get to the core of what they believe, they believe in pride. That's what they, they believe that we, the more pride you have in yourself, the more faith that you have in yourself, that is what they believe. That is the satanic Bible. And so when this line charged at me, he charged because he was threatened and he charged and he is a symbol. He is protecting himself. He is protecting his pride. He is protecting pride. In the rest of my research and the rest of me looking at myself as I begin to say at that point, and I'm testifying to you tonight, I'm kind of laying myself out here. I begin to say, Lord, is there anything in me that is prideful? Again, don't ask that question if you don't have the guts to follow through. Because when the Holy Spirit begins to show you yourself, you have to die to it. There is no resurrection without a death. And it may be something that you have held on to for years. And it's hard. And I won't go into some of the things that the Lord began to show me because they're between me and him. But I, I, they were, I began to, I began, I'll say it like this. I began to see things and the Lord began to show me things and show me scriptures for me to cling on for myself that I could not deny that the Lord was saying, in order for you to go higher, you're going to have to go deeper. You've asked me for this. Now touch the hem of my garment and let's go. Let's get made whole here. And just because I have a ministry and just because I'm getting ready to pastor church and just because I work in the prophetic, again, my gifts have nothing to do with my relationship. The fact that I'm able to preach at all has nothing to do with the intimacy in which I have with my Jesus. If I never preached, if I never prophesied again, if I never any of that again, that doesn't identify, that doesn't, that's not how I identify my relationship to him. My relationship to Jesus is based upon the cutting away of Rana, the, the, the decreasing of Rana and the increasing of the Holy Spirit in my life. And as you do that, and you're on it. You listen, you got to be honest with yourself. It's the hardest. It'll be the hardest thing you've ever done. But as you do that, you will threaten Satan in your life. And guess what? Let's read it for just a second. Let me go back. Let me say this. The male line protects pride. He is protecting the arrogance a pride is a, a, a feeling of, of deep pleasure um, or satisfaction from your own achievements. It ain't about us. It's not about you. Mm -mm. It's never been about you. It's never been about me. It's always been about Jesus Christ. 
It's conscious pride is consciousness, being conscious of your own dignity, your own honor, not God's. That's the satanic church. That's the satanic church operating. That is the spirit of antichrist. Pride is also opposing. Oh, we'll, we'll get to that. Pride is an emotional or an attitude to something with a uh, connection to oneself. That is a def definition, definition of a satanic churchgoer, right? I just said <clears throat> an emotional or an attitude towards something that gives you an arrogant connection to yourself. Look at me. Look how good I am. Look how anointed I am. I've heard people say, when I laid hands on them, or when I prophesied to them, or when I said this, or when I prayed, this happened. Y'all better be careful. I will not have anybody. Listen, I think y'all know what I'm just going to say. I'm going to leave that right there because I want to go to this. I want to go to this scripture with you. So in first Peter. I want y'all. We're going to go here. Chapter five, first Peter. Y'all know the scriptures. Let's see. We'll start at number um, three, I guess. We'll start at number three. Are you ready? Okay, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being a, a, a in samples to the flock. Verse four, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. All right, let me stop right here. So verse five and verse six and verse seven and verse eight is going to be instruction on what to do about satan as a as a charging line or roaring line okay so the lord has given you instruction for this this moment when the enemy feels threatened so to speak so here's your instruction humble yourselves that's number one doesn't that make sense it goes right back to romans you know, 12, the number 12 means the governing of the mind. Govern your mental is what number 12 means in Hebrew. And so when you have number 12, Romans 12, that whole chapter, and you need to read it, is telling you how to govern your soulish realm to get your, your heart right. What a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so Romans 12 is telling you not only not to be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing your mind. He tells you why, because it's the perfect will of God for your life. But he's also telling you how to be a living sacrifice. And one of those things, like we said before, is you cannot think more highly of yourself than you should. Well, right here, when there is a lion seeking like a lion, Satan is like a lion. He is not the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's only a lion that's been threatened. He's being, he's trying to challenge you. He's trying to get you to run. He's trying to get you to be afraid, be fearful, which fearful there doesn't mean, Ooh, I'm scared. It means to show reverence to him, respect, ultimate respect and reverence. It's a worship. It's an obedience is what he's trying to get you to do. In order for you to keep from happening, look at verse um, six. Number one, humble yourselves. Don't just think you know what that means. Look that up. How do you, what does humble yourself mean? How do you do it? Okay, I'm just showing you how I study. Don't just read it and say, well, right here says I humble myself. That's when I'm going to go right there. Well, I'll do it right now. That's when I'll go right there. And then I'll go into my Strong's or I'll go into my, my Blue Letter Bible. I'll put in the scripture of humble yourself. Okay.
just kind of helping you learn how to break stuff down. Never take a preacher's word for it. Never, never take your own mind's word for it. You need to, you need to find out exactly what it's saying. Let me see what verse was we in. Okay. So if we go here, and it means to make low, to bring low, to level. Oh, no. I, I just, something that the Lord spoke to me today. Murchison, get ready. It's going to be so good. To reduce to a plane, to bring into a humble condition, to reduce circumstances, lower rank, to abase myself by humble, even to depress, to oneself bringing down one's pride. Humble yourself means that to have a modest opinion of oneself, avoid all haughtiness. Well, then you may say, well, what's haughtiness? Then you look that up. I'm like, that's how you got to do. You got to keep breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down. Okay. That was a little, that's a little freebie right there. Okay. So humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, well, what does that mean? Don't think that you just know what it means. Find out what that means. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You are unable. If you are exalting yourself, you're not a threat to the enemy. You're on his side. That's what got him kicked out of heaven in the first place. Okay? Is any of this making sense? That he may exalt you in due time. Here's another, here's, here's another point. Ready? For doing a bullet point. Casting all your care up on him. This is a big one. I have to say, I did some di discipling today for about two hours with some people in Alabama. And I ha I talked to people. I do discipleship with people almost with somebody every day. I mean, it's something. And that's just part of my ministry. I love helping people. I love encouraging them, praying with them, those kind of things. You have no idea. It's almost on a daily basis. I'm reminding people and I remind myself. I've had to remind myself of this, that we don't cast our cares. If you're casting your cares on your husband, your friends, your kids, your coworkers, your sister, your brother, you're, then you're already put yourself outside of the word of God. The Bible says that we cast our cares upon him. It doesn't say upon him and your pastor or upon him and the evangelist, upon him and your Facebook friends. Listen. I, I, I'm doing my best here to just, just talk and just say, and just say, this is, these are, these are powerful keys. Don't let something as simple as saying, well, people say, well, you know, I tell, I do talk to God. I do tell God, but the reason why you maybe don't continue to do this or you go away from talking to God and you can then you post on Facebook about all this whatever you're going to do is because you don't believe because I'll put me in here because we don't believe our word we don't believe that it works we believe it works sometimes we won't say that and not out loud we definitely won't say that out loud but we we deep down we, our relationship with Christ and his word is, I hope this works. Come on. You felt that before. I'm going to say this because I, I, I know to say this, I, but in your spirit, you're thinking, I hope this works. Or I know he heals. He just hasn't healed me. I know he can, but I don't know. You know what I'm saying? So we have to cast our care upon him for he careth.
for you. So why would he put that there? Because remember what I've always told you, fruit calleth forth fruit. Love, if you sow love, you reap love. It's the same thing with the father. He's The father is not exempt from his own fruit. He is that fruit. God is love. He's not exempt from it. So if I, if I sow love, I will reap love. It's the same for the father. Fruit calleth forth fruit. It will every time. I hope I'm not boring you guys. I hope I'm, I hope that I'm helping you to see something here. The way I, I hope that I, I'm saying it in the way that you can see it, that you, I want you to look at your own Bibles. Don't take my word for it. I want you to see this is important. I know this is important because I have to tell people this all the time. They know it. They can quote it. They don't believe it because if you believed it, you would do it. When we believe something, we become passionate about it and we operate in what we believe. You will only operate. You will only become passionate about and you will only do the things that you know. You, that's, that's, that's our, in our nature. So we know that you will not say, you will not believe, you will not operate in the things that you don't believe. That's why we have to know the word of God for ourselves. So it says, casting all your cares want for he care for you. Now look at verse eight, be sober, be vigilant. He's, there's no secrets here. He is telling you what to do. He's not making a suggestion. He is telling you, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, yours, he's assigned himself. He's made it his, his mission in life to be your enemy, to be your adversary. He's never going to give up until the final time when he's no longer able to do it as a roaring lion not the lion of judah he appears as a lion not the lion and he only appears as authority because he has none himself he has to take up on what he, you want to know why he took up on the image of a lion? Because deep down he knows about Judah. He knows Judah. And he said, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Or you can say he is looking for those he can threaten. He's looking for those who's going to run. Well, guess what? I'm not running. Run from what? Fear? No, 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 no. He's threatened because I'm not running from the Holy Spirit that is showing Rana who Rana is. I am humbling myself and it takes guts to do it, to say, Lord, Thank you for showing that part of my mind, that part of my heart that's not like you. I'm not running from this. I'm going to look at it head on and I'm going to apply the blood of Jesus in the word and I'm going to transform. I'm not running. I want to look just like you. I don't care if what the price it is I have to pay. I don't care what friends I lose. I don't care who thinks what of me. I'm not. Let the enemy be threatened. I ain't running. I'm not running. I'm going to stand and I'm going to know Jesus Christ in my life. I'm going to know Jesus in my life. Be sober. That means to have no other influence 
no other influence. The news is not influencing you. Facebook, social media, there are people that will post pictures of their family and people on vacation and at the beach. And as soon as you look at it as you're sitting in your dirty house and you don't even know where your man is and the enemy tells you, how come they get to go on vacation? How come their marriage is happy? You don't know where your man is. He'll tell you all kinds of stuff just by you scrolling on Facebook. Don't be influenced by what you see with your natural eyes. Don't be influenced by the things that you hear with natural ears, gossip, fear-mongering from media, government. He's saying, be sober. Don't be influenced. Don't be compassionate about anything in this world. Don't lay up your treasures here. But he's saying, be sober. Remember, remember the scripture that we talked about last week? Follow after me, passionately pursue me. Remember, that's what that meant. That word follow means passionately pursue. He's wanting, when he says be sober, be passionate and pursue truth. Don't be influenced by facts. If you're ever influenced and moved by anything in this world, that is a picture of a lion chasing you and you're running. And guess what? If you run from a lion, he will catch you and you will die. You were not created to run from the enemy. You were created to stand still and prophesy. You were created to be sober. You were created to be vigilant. Well, what does vigilant mean? Vigilant means to be watchful, to avoid danger. Be watchful, be mindful of his word. In every situation, remember I tell you all the time, there is nothing, hear me, there will be, there's nothing new under the sun, nothing. There's nothing new under the sun. There is not something that's going to happen that there's not scripture for. It's impossible. There's nothing you're going to go through. There's nothing you're going to face that he is not your answer. He is not your truth, that he is not your way maker. There is nothing. It really comes to what you believe, what you follow, what you pursue. The fact that you're not influenced. You passionately follow Christ. Okay? Be vigilant. Avoid danger. Because your adversary, the devil, walks. An adversary means opposing force. Antichrist is not some man from the Middle East in an expensive three-piece suit. Antichrist is an opposing force. It's anti-God, anti-truth. Anything that is against the word of God is anti-Christ spirit. It's an opposing, it opposes. It's an adversary to the word of God, okay? So he says, be, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, he even tells you who the adversary, your adversary is not your friend, it's not your job, it's not your husband, your wife, your children, your situation, that is not your adversary, their adversary is the enemy, is Satan, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but principalities, it, an adversary is clearly the enemy, the lion, Okay. The adversary, the devil, walks about like he wants to present himself as powerful as Judah. He's not. He's not your peace. He's not love. He's not long suffering. He's not your joy. He's the opposing force of those things, he's opposing fruit. But he presents himself as a fruit. He presents himself as this. 
You got to imagine when Lucifer used to walk to and fro guarding the stones of fire. He was a angel, the most beautiful. His body was music. When he moved, he was sound. Lucifer was. And with all his beauty and with all his power as an archangel, he looked and decided to protect the pride. And in protecting the pride, he charged after truth. But truth stood. And truth laid down his life and stretched forth his hands and said, it is finished. And Jesus descended into hell and he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from this adversary, Satan. He took his authority and he's been trying to give them to you all this time. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Be alert and resist Satan. Be mindful. The Bible says, My people, they are destroyed because they don't know me. In other words, they run. And they're eaten and they die because they don't know me. So when that line came in my room that night and began to walk around, he was only there because what I'm doing in my secret place, because the things I do in secret, the Lord will reward me openly. What the things that I'm doing in my own heart that has nothing to do with Harrison Ministries, that has nothing to do with Zoom, that has nothing to do with the prophetic. It's just me and Jesus. It's so threatening to hell that Satan himself had to show up. Well, guess what? This girl's not running. I'm going to stand and know who my Jesus is. Amen. I can do it. And if God is calling me to do it, you can too. You know what it is? It's a choice. It's a choice. It's not an emotion. It's not goosebumps. It's not 10 steps to this program. It's simply choosing him over and over every day. Every moment of the day, choosing Jesus, no matter what. No matter what. If you lose everything, if you don't ever get your way, if they take everything from us, if they drop us in the middle of a desert with no clothes, no food, no water, we are going to die. I want to be the one that says, you're still God. You're still God. Amen. Whew. When you follow in these instructions that we read in First Peter, you are reminding Satan that he's not all that in a bag of chips, that he's not all powerful, that authority was not given to him over you, that you have been given authority over him. God will provide his continual presence. He will continually bring his presence to you, knowledge, wisdom, 
you'll grow in him. You'll get to know him. That is you resisting the devil. He will flee from you. He will flee from you. James 4, 7, I'm going to read you this scripture. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The charge is, is you charge, you're resisting. To, to resist the devil, for him to flee, is that then you don't run. You stand and know who God is, and you wear the enemy out with the word. You don't change your passion. You don't change you passionately following after Christ, speaking his word, wear the enemy out, make him sick. You've heard me say this, make him sick to death of hearing your voice, talking about the goodness of God and how you are saved, how you are healed and how you are delivered. Submit to God. That's the secret of resisting submission. Find out what that is. How do you submit to God? Find it out. Don't take my word for it. Submitting to God. Resisting the devil. He will flee from you. Ephesians 6.11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Again, we're not running. The enemy only will charge you when he is threatened because he expects you to run. Here's, here's Ephesians 6.11 saying it again, stand, stand against the wiles of the devil. Stand against is another way of saying resist him. Stand in the Greek indicates that one must hold fast a critical position as an army must do in warfare. Be unmovable. Don't be tossed to and fro. Don't be um, double-minded. Know what you believe. And don't let anybody, anything, persuade you different. I'm, try I'm trying to, to get this over. Hold your ground. Stand firm. Do not surrender. I mean, I, I just wrote these things down. Have faith. Be solid. Be unmovable. I, I, I have so many things here. We could just keep going. We, I'm, we're probably going to, I'm probably going to have to continue this. There's so much here. I hope that encourages you this week. I hope that you receive something out of this. I hope that your life is an example of his powerful anointing. I hope that your relationship with Jesus is threatening to the kingdom of hell. My relationship threatens hell. <laughs> My relationship with Christ threatens the enemy. That is a good place to be. Amen. And it's not arrogance. It is truth being a living example in my life. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you're showing us. I thank you, Father, that you love me enough to show me myself. I thank you for that I've been given the opportunity to decrease so that you may increase. And Father, I pray that you would continue to show me, continue to work through me and in me, Father. Lord, I pray that someone on this Zoom, someone on this YouTube right now in the name of Jesus heard something that's going to build their faith and help them to stand, not run. We're going to stand. We're going to grow and we're going to know you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you glory in Jesus' name. For those of you that's going to be at Hope in Murchison, Texas for the Serve Conference, I will be there on that Saturday and Sunday to preach. And I already have a word the Lord has given to, given to me. I can't wait to prophesy. 
I can't wait to be see your face. If you're on Zoom, if you're on YouTube and you make it to East Texas, let me know that you're there. So many times we're on the road and we're like, hey, I never met you, but I watch you on Zoom. Or, hey, I see you on YouTube. Or, hey, I've seen you on this. But guess what? I want to know. I want to see your face. And I want to say thank you for making the sacrifice to come. Also, our book is at the very end of the editing. We're at the very, very end. And I think Jason and I are going to write a whole new chapter together. There's going to be one chapter that we're going to write together. And it's going to be finished. It's going to be such a great book. And we've already been cleared. We're going to be um, um, going on once the book is available. Then we're going to be going on a program called It's Supernatural with Sid Roth. And we're going to share some miraculous stories. This is what has been told to me. And so this is what we're thinking that's going to happen. And so I've had many people. I've had two or three people to tell me that people call in. To that show and has requested Harrison Ministries and has requested us as to be a guest. So if the Lord opens that door, we're going to walk through it. We're going to walk through it and we're going to be there. It was prophesied to me by Gustavo Pice from Colombia. He said, um, the Lord has brought TV opportunity for you to go on TV twice and you keep turning it down. And he said, the opportunity is getting ready to come around. Don't turn it down. And so I'm not going to turn it down this time. I'm going to go forth and I am going to share the gospel in any which way that the Lord opens the door for me. So anyway, be praying for us, be praying for our new church um, that we hear soon about where we're going. The name of the church, if you want to continue to start being a prayer partner with us, is a rain discipleship church. And that's rain, not like it's raining outside, but rain, like overcoming, being conquerors. He has called us to be kings and priest. And so Rain Discipleship Church is what it's called. And uh, we're just going to go through the doors as they open. We're just going to go right there. But we're hoping once we get in the building, get settled, we're going to set a date, a grand opening date. That's when we're going to invite all of you, anybody that can. I hope you all, all you guys come and come and help us to celebrate and to um, pray and anoint this this place and let's get this church going all right all right i will see you guys next monday let me look at something real quick i i, I never know what day it is well i know it's monday but i'm talking about dates so yes I will see y'all next Monday for sure. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. See ya. <laughs>